and welcome to the podcast, Daniel. I've been really looking forward to this chat and um, I've been working my way through the book that you and your dad wrote. And I, I mean, I have so many ways that I think that this conversation can go, but I just wanted to, to say thank you so much for, for agreeing to this conversation with me. Mm, thanks for having me, Kat. It's great yeah. to be here. Um, I have to like have my little like nerdy moment of, you know, I've been reading the book. I'm a pretty fast reader, but this book is taking me quite a bit of time to get through because it is so dense and I have to pause and I have to highlight and I have to write my own notes and I have to like have my own sort of like journaling moments with it as I'm going through it. So um, anybody who's out there, highly, highly recommend picking up the book Myth of Normal. And, um, you know, I've read pretty much everything that your dad's put out. And I have to say that I reached out to you because I could tell that this one felt different. Um, and, you know, I think your dad shares in the beginning of the forward, like, hey, like, this isn't just, you know, uh, the co-writing, um, you know, Mark is, was a real true collaboration. And I just want to say that, like, I could tell as a reader that it, that it felt that way too, going through it. Oh, I appreciate that. And it sounds like you're reading it very closely Yeah, uh, with yeah. a lot of, you know, attention and intention. So that's, that's great. And just incidentally for your, for your listeners, uh, if audiobooks are your jam, then there is one and I'm the voice of it. Uh, which most people seem to be really enjoying. There's a few people who are like, I really wanted Gabor's voice. His voice is healing. <laughs> and I'm like, well, first of all, it depends what day you get him on. And secondly, <laughs> he mumbles. The guy mumbles. <laughs> you yeah. got to enunciate with a book this long. So, yeah. Uh, I don't think he has the, I don't think he has the patience to, to be in a recording booth for as long as it took me to record this. Mm, yeah. You know, it's, an 18, it's an 18 hour book, but it probably it took. Is you know, double the length to get it done. Anyway, oh, I'm that's, sure. that's available as well for those who, and some people have read it and listened, you know, some people sort of pair those things up, which is really cool. Yeah, actually, um, this is like my super nerdy moment is like when it's a book like this, um, there's been a couple of books that I've done this and the ones that I'm talking about are like the ones that feel like master classes in and of itself. Mm -hmm. I will have the physical book so that I can make my notes and I'll have the audio book in the background. And so I feel like I, I like your voice feels really familiar to me because I've already spent probably like 10 hours with your voice. Oh, you're doing that. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, but yeah, I um, particularly reached out because I don't think that people are talking about trauma in the collective as much as it's really needed. Um, I think that there's a lot of really beautiful work being done in terms of trauma healing for individuals and working through familial things, but um, it's the first time I've seen it truly expanded out into this like collective landscape. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the thing that I get really excited about is um, I shared with you when I reached out that I work with spiritual entrepreneurs. And what I mean by that is it's folks who are leaning into their businesses, their entrepreneurship journey as an opportunity to work through a lot of the triggers that maybe came up for them in other arenas in their life. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, I felt like I had worked through a lot of my anxious attachment style in my relationships with my family and my romantic partners, but then, you know, bringing it into business, it's like, oh, this is all coming back up again for me in this different little landscape. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, having you guys really delineate both the, like how trauma affects the body and the individual. But then I think it starts in like chapter 19 or so you start really expanding it into like the collective and capitalism and sort of that encompassing soup that we all swim and, and live yeah. in, 
you know. And Capitalism, so, which which invented entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah. Although so maybe that's not true. It depends. It depends how you define the term. I mean, an entrepreneur could be an artisan, anyone who sets out to ply their trade in the world. And there've been entrepreneur in in that sense, there've been entrepreneurs all the way throughout history before the advent of modern capitalism. But certainly, you know, capitalism wants to lay claim to, to the idea of business and trade and transaction. And it does it in a particular way. And then it pretends that it's the only way of doing it and damn, damn the costs to our health and wellness and happiness and sanity. Yeah. And I think that that's exactly where I wanted to take this conversation is like, where can we find the nuance, you know, um, where can we find that place where, um, I mean, I would love it if we could sort of like do a 180 degree shift on all these things, but that's not how the, that's not the pace at which the world works in. And so as we're moving towards, you know, this work of trauma healing and integration, um, like where's, where's the nuance that you see? In that space um well it's a nuanced question uh and it's a broad question let me see i mean this is what you'll ask your questions and i'll say some things and if yeah you know and god <laughs> god how. willing god willing there'll, there'll be some kind of correlation um i think uh well nuance is only as good as your ability to perceive it. it It's not there until you perceive it. Nuance is, is, is a function of interpretation. It's a function of perception, the ability to, to, to perceive fine-grained differences between things. And I think nuance is also founded in... I mean, it's almost like having... It's like musical pitch, you know? Some people have it, some people don't. Some people have it to greater or lesser degrees. I have perfect pitch, you know? So you could ask me to play an E-flat and I could play it or sing it. I could you know, sing it um, w- without having an instrument to, uh, to go, you know, that, so I've got a reference point in my head and I can tell the difference between a slightly sharp or slightly flat note. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something you're basically born with. But in terms of the capacity to perceive nuance, that's something that we can develop. Uh, and I think it's a skill. And I think you have to want to see things in a nuanced way. Well, what does that take from each of us? I mean, I think in the way you phrased the question, it sort of sounded like you were saying, where's the nuance out there? There is no nuance out there. Uh, There's life out there. Life is just happening. The world is just as it is. We can see it in black and white. And sometimes that's helpful. There are moments when nuance is not what's for dinner. You know, like if... I don't know if there if a, if a nuclear air raid siren went off right now, it would not be the time for me to be starting to think about the finer points of disarmament and who started the conflict and whatever. It would be time to get in the fucking basement. Yeah. You know? Um, and then there's times when nuance, I think a lot of times when nuance, which is also to say sophistication, distinction, uh, fine grained perception, you know, 2020 vision or better, um, Thoughtfulness, curiosity, Mm -hmm. wonder, mystery. These are all, it's a whole constellation of, of human perceptual faculties that are either greater or lesser developed, you know? And if you think about the sort of regimes in which there is no nuance, well, a fascist regime is a place where nuance is outlawed, Mm -hmm. you could say, Mm -hmm. right? And, and why is that? Well, because there's something subversive about seeing nuances, because if you see nuances, you see the in-between notes, you see the in-between colors, you see the shades of things. You can't be manipulated as easily yeah. because you won't be afraid of the opposite thing, you know, because if, if it's a binary, if it's only good and bad or good and evil or right and wrong, well, then you must position yourself in the favorable one and then be afraid of or loathe the other one, right? Mm-hmm. But the minute people are allowed to think for themselves, they start noticing things. And I think so nuance, the, 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 the skill of nuance starts with noticing. And our book is, I think, really aimed at helping to sharpen people's vision in that sense, apply a sharper lens to see, oh, actually, for instance, you know, this rash of chronic illnesses we're seeing or addiction. Well, the myth of normal would say 
it's either not happening or it's just there's sort of an easy explanation for it or 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 it's a, or they pretend that it's mysterious yeah and we're saying or or they would say it's genetic say right and we're saying actually if you squint your eyes and look clearly squint your eyes and look closer as Ani DeFranco said um you start to see connections between things that that the myth of normal would have you think are disparate. Mm-hmm. So economic class and illness, what's the connection? Well, stress. Yeah. Right? Um, childhood adversity and later mental illness. What's the connection? Trauma. You know? So trying to give names to things that are invisible inside of the prevailing conversation and in, inside of the prevailing mindset. I mean, what did Morpheus do for Neo except give him a pill that let him see the nuances of things? But also in the sense, the minute he saw the nuances of things, he also saw the, he also saw the stark reality of things because he saw the actual stakes. So it, there is a flip side to it because once you see the nuances, now you're faced with, oh, wait a minute, there's an urgency. Because... Usually seeing the nuances means you might have some agency in the matter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we might like, if it's not necessarily so that human beings are destined to get cancer at these exorbitant rates or that suicides should be going up among young people or self-cutting or whatever, like, cause we forget that it wasn't this way. Yeah. That it, you know, we were like the frog in the pot of water that just gets accustomed to it. Well, if in fact it's not predestined, well, then we each are accountable in a certain sense for acting on what we know. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I think nuance starts with a willingness and it also starts with a willingness to be able to hold a mixed emotions and contradictory perceptions at the same time and paradoxes, contradictory perceptions in the sense, first of all, that we're going to have to you know, we're not going to shed all our, our illusions at once. They're, they're, you know, they're baked in there from a lifetime. So while we're onboarding, you could say, to use a newfangled word, new perceptions, new realities like, oh, wait a minute. I have blind spots about other people's traumas, other groups' traumas, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like think, take someone who, for instance, is like all up in arms about woke culture and is like, they're trying to blame everything on racism or whatever. Now, look, I'm not saying you can't have a a rational discussion about some of the, you know, a critical discussion about some of the excesses of social justice politics. You know, there's plenty of, I think you could have a valid, but that's a separate question. Sure. For people who are knee jerk, sort of conservative in this way and are like, oh, you know, everyone's trying to blame everything on society. Well, there's going to be cognitive dissonance when you find out that actually stress lives in the body and that there's science that shows that, you know, minority groups carry the stress and that there's intergenerational stress and that this is scientifically shown. It's not actually controversial. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So then you start to realize, Oh, I'm the superstitious one. I'm the one who's holding on to an outdated conviction that it's all up to the individual, which is of course what capitalism wants us to think. Well, I'm uncomfortable with this new insight. I don't like that. It doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to have a certain ability to tolerate that discomfort. Otherwise, you're just going to try to kick that thing to the curb before it has, you know, before it, 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 it poses the danger of, of, of upsetting your apple cart. Yeah. You know? Um, and then there are paradoxes as well. When you see nuance, you, you see that things are yes. And, and um, a certain capacity to hold multiple things at once and to have mixed feelings. You can be sad, you can be angry, you can be hopeful, you can be despairing. You know, I think human maturity is able to encompass a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And art is really good for that. This is why art is also kind of outlawed in totalitarian countries or at least genuine art that comes from the human soul because the human soul paints in all different kinds of shades and colors and sounds and it doesn't follow a rigid set of whatever so that's you know that's that's a a wildly uh uh, chaotic answer to (laughs) 
to your question. Yeah, and I and I left the question broad on purpose because I I knew you would take it to a place that that'd be just kind of fun to like unpack and explore. And as you were speaking, you know, just nervous system regulation, nervous system regulation, nervous system regulation just kept coming up for me. Mm. You know, everything about nuance as you're sort of explaining it. I feel like goes back to how safe do you feel in your nervous system? Sure. In that, like, you know, if you're threatened, like the, the bomb example that you gave, like everything that we see has to be a binary, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's mm -hmm. how you survive. Yep. And so if we know that we are in a binary state, when we go into me versus you, um, black and white thinking, then it brings that responsibility and that accountability back to the individual mm -hmm. to then be like, oh, okay, so I might not be seeing this situation as clearly as I need to be. And in fact, you know, basically, if I'm not feeling the title of your podcast in any moment, <laughs> if I'm not feeling empowered and I'm not feeling curious, I'm probably not seeing it as clearly as I could. Mm -hmm. that's a kind of hard and fast rule. I think mm. that there's something clouding my view, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's okay to go through those. We have to go through periods where we Absolutely. lose touch with it. But, but when we're at our best, there's an ability to ask genuinely curious questions. And one kind of nuance that is sort of an obvious one that stems from the book we wrote that I think a lot of people have difficulty with, but uh, people are getting better at it. I think my dad has faced, this sort of misgiving or objection or reservation for a long time. And I think it's frustrated him because he's like, I keep saying, don't blame parents. It's not about blaming parents. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, and yet yeah. People are like, ah, Gabor Mate, he's a little blamey, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I get why, because people don't know how to think outside the realm of whose fault is it? Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. And, yeah. you know, and there might be something about my dad's energy. That's a little heavy that leaves people feeling a little like, ugh. He's not using the word blame, but I feel blamed. You know, I get mm. that. I'm his son. I get that. Uh, but, <laughs> but, if, but, but if you look at just what we're saying in the book, the substance of it, there's a nuance, yeah. which is to say, and, and, and it lives in, the, especially in the world of the, what we call the, the small T trauma, yeah. which is not the events. I mean, there's, look, there's nuance in big T traumas too, even in a family where there was physical abuse or sexual abuse. You know, there's very often the case that parents actually loved their kids. They didn't know how to love them as a verb in a way that was healthy. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they did so in ways that were manifestly unhealthy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we could say deplorable, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't parental love there. There was just, right. it, it was just, it was just twisted. Right. Yeah. But especially in families where there was none of that. All there was, was a certain kind of emotional impoverishment. And who among us can say that we didn't, that we got everything we needed emotionally. Our yeah. society is not set up to provide it. Yeah. It's not about this family's better than this family is that families aren't supported and families need to be supported because in fact, there's no distinction between collective and individual trauma. Individuals end up traumatized because the collective fails to to create a container in which the individual can grow up in a non-traumatized way. It's all yes, one, it's all absolutely. connected, you know, like, mm -hmm. like they said in, in the wire, right? All the pieces matter. That's mm -hmm. why I love that show. Very nuanced show. Mm -hmm. And you don't see nuance in cop shows very often, mm -hmm. you know, but it was actually, anyway, you got to see how yeah. everyone, the criminals and the police were playing the same game yeah. and nobody was winning. Uh, in any case, when it comes to these small T trauma situations, a child grows up with two ostensibly happy, loving parents. There's no divorce. There's no fighting. Uh, but the child ends up with the remnants of and the marks and the wages of trauma. Huh. What happened? Well, the Mates are saying it's because their parents traumatized them. Must be the parents' fault. Well, not exactly. The parents didn't do anything and certainly nothing on purpose. Yeah. Trauma can happen from the things that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the nuance is also that yes, personal responsibility and agency 
is a crucial piece of being a responsible human being, a responsible citizen, and of healing. Because mm-hmm. no one's going to heal for you. Yeah. And at the same time, we're saying you didn't create the life, the, the world that created your life, which means that in many senses, a lot of your choices have been constrained by things you never chose. Mm-hmm. Choice only begins at the point of recognition mm-hmm. and awareness, which is another reason people want to stay asleep because they don't want to be in a position of choice. Right. Yeah. You know, we, we want, we, we want to not have to be responsible. So that's a, that, I mean, that's a whole kettle of nuances right there Yeah, that yeah. it takes. And I think reading the book slowly is in a way a sign that you are taking in the information bit by bit, kind of titrating it and making room for all the various things in your cog on your cognitive, sh- you know, bookshelf in yeah. your cupboard and making sure that everything has a place. Yeah. And it's a real, like, both and Correct. sort of experience in, in everything, right? Like, you know, I can say that my parents weren't capable of meeting all of my needs and, you know, say that I have marks of trauma within, you know, my behaviors and, and my feelings and, and all of those layers in between. And that doesn't excuse me from the responsibility if I want to live a life that feels empowered and feels like it is full of joy. Yeah. You know, well, so that's nuance level one. Let me, let me give you the graduate level one. Yeah. You could say that your parents weren't able to give you everything you needed and it's your responsibility. But what if I throw anger into the mix? What if your parents never stopped doing the things that they did back when you were small and now you're an adult? Mm -hmm. What if you see the ways that you're still carrying that trauma into your life? Maybe you're sick. Maybe you're in an abusive relationship. Maybe you're depressed. Maybe you're addicted Mm -hmm. and you Mm -hmm. realize, oh, my childhood, I'm living out the pain of that in various ways. Yeah, of course. You may have to go through some feelings oh, 100%. that don't exactly align with being Zen about the thing, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. especially if you choose to continue to engage with these people. Mm-hmm. Now, this is what my dad and I's next book is about, about mm. adult parent child relationships, right? Mm-hmm. And there's all kinds of nuances to that, including the fact, as I've been discovering that Forgiveness doesn't happen by fiat. It doesn't happen by decree. It happens by grace Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it happens when it's ready to, and you can be willing to forgive, but you can't will it into existence. Yeah. It's not yours to do. Yeah. To forgive is divine. I think that's what that phrase means to me. So healing is a nuanced thing too. Mm -hmm. And authenticity is a nuanced thing. And anyone who takes anything my dad says, or we say, and turns it into a new dogma or a new Instagram brand or whatever, yeah, uh, is doing what everyone does with everything inside of our soundbite culture, which is to, to leech the truth out of the truth because the truth lives in the complexity and in the aliveness of it. And in each person um, wrestling with it and engaging with it themselves and seeing where does it apply to them? Because Mm -hmm. not every statement we make may resonate for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you guys make space for that, you know, Um, that was one of my chief tasks. (laughs) <laughs> on the book. No, honestly, it was. I mean, yeah. the research is my dad's, the thesis is his, the decades of experience and mm-hmm. the thousands of people he's worked with, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people he's worked with. I mean, yeah. it's his baby. Mm-hmm. But one of the one of the, the things I was called to do in the mission of joining the book was to make sure that it, it, it was accessible to everybody. Mm-hmm not just people who are already a bard, the trauma train or in the yeah. new age world or speak the language of Bessel van der Kolk or whatever mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. that if this, if what we're saying is true, then it should be able to be said in a bunch of different ways. Yeah. And it should be honest about its limitations. Yeah. And for all my dad's strengths, 
um, a kind of humility about his content, like a, like a sort of, well, well nuance, I mean, nuance speaks, is, is, it's not, it's, speaks it's the jargon, right? Like, well, it's not about just about jargon, but he think he see, he sees the world in a, in quite a black and white way in the sense that he sees things other people don't. And that's true. Mm-hmm. He really does. He always has. Mm-hmm. And that's his superpower. And put to the best use, that makes him an advocate. You know, he's willing to say things other people aren't willing to say. He's willing sure. to make connections aren't people, other people aren't willing to make. And sometimes someone like that can get themselves into trouble, especially when they're speaking on a massive platform. And we wanted this book to be massive. I mean, we went with Penguin Random House for a reason. We felt like it was time... And we had no idea that COVID was coming and that trauma would become such a, even more of a buzzword, right? Mm-hmm. We didn't, I, I didn't know that this was, book was going to be the bestseller that it is. Sometimes when you're on that big a stage, you can get into trouble if you forget that you're speaking to a lot of different kinds of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that you have to boil your message down to its real essentials and be really careful about what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's something that like I appreciated because like I feel like you reference so many of the books that that live on my bookshelf as like permanent fixtures <laughs> and my biggest criticism if I could ever criticize um, has been that this work around trauma needs to be accessible to everybody yeah you know not just nerdy nervous system nerds like me <laughs> like um well that's why i included an en vogue reference yeah <laughs> and no, uh was it en vogue who's saying weak in the knees no that's uh swv sorry mm-hmm. but um i i think that well just to share a little bit of of my history is that like I came from the world of acupuncture and working with bodies directly and working um, with trauma that's stored in bodies. And what I found is that this beautiful medicine that I fell in love with of like Taoist origins, we shove that into a Western medical model Mm -hmm. that is quite frankly, traumatized and continues to traumatize. Mm -hmm. Um, And I worked in fertility medicine for a long time. Mm. And I mean, like, that's just like, that can be a whole other (laughs) discussion of trying to understand and like untangle the intricacies of trauma and what we're doing to women. Um, And like, there's this thing that we do with You know, I think that you would relate to it as art. I relate to it as Taoist medicine, where in order to make it accessible to folks, we strip the magic and the artistry out of it. Hmm. And to me, like... Do you think that's about making it accessible or do you think that's about making it marketable? Maybe a little bit of both. Um, but I think that what I appreciated about the myth of normal is that there's a level of accessibility without taking the magic out of it. Mm. Do you know what I mean? That's great to hear. Is, is I'm always a little bit wary when like books about trauma and nervous systems are written for the masses because I've read them and I'm like, yeah, you kind of got it, but you took the beauty out of it Mm. you know like you're like you're almost like speaking to the dumbest person in the room to like to be a little colloquial about it well i think that the inclusion of so many first person stories in our book Mm -hmm. keeps the beauty on the front burner because people's stories are beautiful i mean people Mm -hmm. people are so human in the Mm -hmm. way they tell them and and they're just some of them are just amazing and all of Mm -hmm. them are are some of them are shocking and some of them are, many of them are just very relatable, I think. And, um, they're very illustrative yeah. and illuminating. So, um, no, look for a, with a 500 page book, it better be on some level fun to read. Not really, not really fun given the content, but, but 
sort of inherently rewarding, the language better grab you. But also, you hopefully you're building a, a, a good feeling in you as you're reading it, even if it's a holy shit, things are a lot worse than I imagined kind of feeling. Mm-hmm. It's bracing, and hopefully that's giving you a, you know, a, like it's like a good sauna. That's like mm-hmm. you're sweating something out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to sit with that question of like, is it about accessibility or is it about marketability? And like, I think that that is an important question as, you know, a lot of my listeners are, you know, trying to build up their practices. A lot of them have some sort of service of, of healing and to hold this, this thought of, how do we make this kind of work, healing, spirituality work, accessible without um, stripping the magic out and in a way kind of like, like it's like this kind of stuff is, is going to be hard to market, you know? Yeah. Well, let's think about that for a second. I mean, As far as accessibility is concerned, I wonder about that word Mm. because what do we really mean by that? What is it? I mean, if you boil, we want it to be accessible down to its essence. Well, you could mean it in the sense of sort of equity that we want anyone to be able to access it no matter the structure with no structural impediments to it. Right. Sure. So like a ramp for disabled people would make a building accessible, right? So that so about it's about inclusion, inclusivity. Sure. Sure. That's one meaning of the word accessible. But I think ultimately, in some ways, the word accessible, the way it's the way it's usually accessed, kind of boils down to dumbing it down to the point where you can sell it. Like how you know how it's simple. How, it, it it assumes somehow that dilution is the gate, the pathway to distribution, Mm -hmm. to dissemination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, and it's, and it's a means to an end. You know, we're trying to, as opposed to starting from the magic, what is this thing? Mm -hmm. What's beautiful about it? What's special about it? Where does it meet a human need? Mm -hmm. Are we expressing Are we present to the magic of it or are we just, you know, are we just selling something? Mm -hmm. I have a business. I suppose I am in some sense, a kind of healing entrepreneur of some kind. I never, ever speak of myself that way. It's just not language that occurs to me. I just didn't grow up in the culture of business and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I just, I'm just a little sort of happily clueless about that stuff, but I started a business which is to say I provide a service and I charge people money for it. Mm-hmm. And I call it mental chiropractic. The service is called take a walk with Daniel, where I take walks with people. Literally <laughs> we walk together there on the, it, it, most people are all over the world. So we do it by phone. Mm-hmm. If they're in the same place as me, they happen to be in New York or if we're in the same city. We do it there. Well, that's a nice gimmick. You know, that's a nice sort of unique product and mental chiropractic is a unique kind of thing. It's like a nice little brand and it is what it sounds like. I'm making adjustments to people's perceptions, not just anyone, any, someone who comes to me and says, I'm stuck with something in my life, which is to say, I can't see the nuance. (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can only see the way it is and the thing I don't want to do. Like there's just a bunch of bad choices. Yeah. I'm stuck. And by the end of the walk, they're not stuck, which is to say they're seeing a bunch of different options, not in terms of me coaching them and saying, do this, do that. I don't make suggestions. Right. I'm shifting like a chiropractor, whatever you think about chiropractic. I, I know there's controversy about it, but it, the, the metaphor is useful nonetheless. I'm making an adjustment to the spine of their mind. Okay. Well, for me, I haven't advertised the thing. Mm-hmm. Now people are coming to me because I wrote a book now, you know, like that's, I was having people before, but now it's a lot more, mm-hmm. but 
I haven't had to dumb it down. Mm-hmm. When people ask me, like, it would be a lot more accessible if I was like, therapy in one session or like power coaching while walking or something like right. that. <laughs> yeah. And when people ask me what it is, I tell them what it isn't. Mm-hmm. I say, I don't know what it is. It's a mystery. You're going to have to find out, but I'll mm-hmm. tell you what the result is. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you why I give a shit. And I don't mess around with that. Mm-hmm. And I don't mess around so much that I will not do a walk with somebody if it's not aligned. I refuse to do my thing if it's not my thing. So if someone comes to me looking for just a walk with a mate, because they just want to talk to me for an hour, I say, thank you very much. I'm going to refund your money (laughs) or I won't even take it in the first place. If someone comes to me and they want therapy, they just want to share about their childhood and they're not hungry to crack some code by the end of the hour and a half, because I don't want to see them next week. I don't Mm -hmm. have that kind of patience. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not a good business strategy. I'm turning away repeat customers. People can always come back. But for me, the integrity of my product is such that it should mean that you're not coming back next week. Mm -hmm. If you are, I didn't do my job. Now, why is that important to me? I don't know, because I love it. And I don't love the other thing. Yeah. Like there's a particular frequency on which I resonate at which I perform at my best. Mm-hmm. And I'm really, really, really good at this. And when I try to deviate even one degree to the left or right, I mean, I can be flexible, but if it's off, it's off. And when it's off, I'm just, I'm stressing myself. It doesn't flow. I'm not doing them any favors that, you know, I get a headache afterwards and I've stopped walks, you know, in the middle, but when I'm in the zone and I'm the one who has to insist on being in the zone. So I could make it more accessible by being more quote unquote flexible, less rigorous about the intention and the design of what I do. But to me, that's not worth it Mm -hmm. because now I'm doing what you said. I'm taking the magic of it comes from the strange alchemy between this thing I made up and my particular personality and the people who come to me. And I actually ultimately don't think it's about my personality because I'd like to write a book about this and teach other people how to do it. There's absolutely no reason I should be the world's only mental chiropractor. It's actually not that hard. I just need to sort of do it enough that I can get underneath it and figure out how it works enough to communicate to people. So it's like, how do I not lose, lose the magic? I insist on it. Yeah. And if it's not there, I will stop doing it. Period. Yeah. There's so many pieces of this that I want to just like highlight for the listeners of my community here, because one of the most common questions that I get is around, like you weren't talking about niching, but essentially you were talking about niching (laughs) and niching. Yeah. Niching. So like, um, like identifying who it is that you serve. Got it. And being unapologetic about, about that person that you serve or that community that you serve. And, you know, again, like we can sort of talk about the, the trauma piece around here because I have a lot of folks who come in and they're saying, you know, I don't want to niche down because that means that I'm, I'm not making myself accessible to everybody. You know, I'm, you know, I have this, this gift, whatever their modality, whatever their gift, their particular flavor of gift is. And, you know, it seems like so many people would benefit from this. And so why would I limit the the kind of people that I see? And when we dig underneath the surface and the layers of that, oftentimes what comes up is, you know, uh, a child who was a little bit of a people pleaser and like needed to be oh, sure. of service for everybody to make sure that they felt like they were going to be loved and belong, you know? Yes. Yes. I, I wonder though about the term niching, mm. which sounded to me like Nietzsche for a second. Um, because I'm not doing, I'm not, I don't have a niche. Yeah. It's not, that's not what it is to me. I have a, I have a standard. Mm-hmm. I have a, um, I have a specific intention and I'm going to do that and people can level, people can meet me there. Yeah. I'm not going to exclude anyone, anyone. Yeah. Including people who can't afford it. Yeah. yeah. I have a sliding scale. You just have to put in an amount that would be 
an ante for you that would be skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has to be a significant amount to you. It has yeah. to it has to matter what mm -hmm. the because ultimately this thing does not reside on my brilliance. It, it resides on you know the client bringing a willingness to get unstuck because when you're stuck i promise you there's a part of you that's per perfectly content to stay there yeah, forever absolutely it's gotten you this Very far happy you're to fine stay there. <laughs> trauma is you know can be very cozy, at least the, 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 the coping mechanism, trauma is not cozy, but the coping mechanisms that we developed and the safe place, you know, the safe spaces we have inside ourselves, the, the comfort zones, right? Yeah. Which is another yeah. way of saying safe space. Yeah. Um, so I demand something. Yeah. It's the, so what I have is conditions. Mm -hmm. It's not a niche, it's conditions. And I'm explicit about them with people. And I'm unapologetic about it. And I'm excited about it. Yeah. Because I'm telling you, it's like total informed consent. If you're in, you're in. If you're not in, you're not in. Yeah. Now, I understand that for other people providing certain kinds of services, you may need to decide on demographic questions or audience or who you're going to market to or all that. That's uh, that's beyond my pay grade. I don't, I don't really know about that kind of stuff. But I would just, again, as with words like accessibility... I think it's worth every now and then stopping for a moment, looking at the sort of jargonistic businessy words that we're using yeah. and interrogating. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know, because if I'm thinking even in the phrase niching down, well, that implies that cr that creates a whole world, that phrase, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can boil something down to its essence and that's positive, you know, that there's something, but like, does the phrase niching down give you a good feeling? Does it inspire you? If not, I would find another way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what about refining? What about honing in, <laughs> you know, yeah. there's, you know, because when we start trying to fit ourselves into boxes that have come to us via other people's advice and counsel, because that's what worked for them. Mm -hmm. Well, the content may be good, but content is overrated. Context is the thing. Yeah. And we got to be working inside of a context that works for us. Yeah. And, you know, the way that I talk about it with my audience is it's less about identifying the demographic of like, you know, is this person male or female or like what income level are they at or even, you know, all the other sort of like exterior factors and... You know, I think ultimately it comes down to what it is that you're speaking of, which is, can you support this person at whatever level of their journey is and hold that in integrity yes. and be incredibly, I want to say solid in that mm -hmm. because True I think to that. that, yeah. And I think that we, when we are really intentional about who we say yes to and also who we say no to, we end up being of greater service to the collective. And sure. so, you know, not everyone's going to resonate with my stuff because not everybody wants to dig into their trauma as we talk about it in the context of their business, right? right. Nobody wants to like necessarily talk about how to regulate your nervous system when somebody says no to you. Right. But for the right aligned people, that's going to be the safest place that they can do that deeper level inquiry. Yeah. You know, and that's what I'm hearing about, you know, mental chiropractics for you is it's, it, by holding to your own integrity and by being really clear about what it is that you do, it is creating a safe place so that somebody can come in and be like, Oh, like I get to actually like lean into this and someone's actually going to ask me the hard questions. Yeah. I mean, that's the, when I, when I tell people first off, off the bat, just so you know, I'm not a therapist. Most people say, thank God mm -hmm. you know, I've had Same another. Here. Yeah. So a, a, just a couple of things that came up from what you said. Um, what were they? Well, first of all, integrity, integrity to what it have, to, you know, again, I use the chiropractic metaphor advisedly, 
alignment. <laughs> alignment is not a free floating abstract concept. You can't be aligned. It's not like a it's not like a an intransitive ver verb like to al to align with what? It's always in reference to something. Now it could be with itself, but even then you have that assumes you know what the aligned configuration is. <laughs> You know, a snake has a different alignment than a slinky, uh, than a than a than a than a hockey stick. You know, yep. even though they're all kind of lines, right? The human spine has a certain alignment. This vertebra on top of that vertebra, muscles in this way. You know, nerves, whatever. I don't. I know very little about it. Okay. Well, so similarly, our endeavors, our enterprises, are aligned with something, and I would say you could call it an intention, or a mission, or a calling which is to say, not just what do I do, but what do I provide for people? What do I love seeing people get? What do I want to see more of in the world? And for me, it's a kind of crystal clarity. You know, there's a kind of crystalline moment where someone snaps into a new perception and, and all of their the impediments that were stopping them from feeling a sense of possibility are just gone. And they're like, oh, I can absolutely, I, oh, Silly me. I get it. I live for that. I live for that. And I will, I will expend a lot of very happy effort getting someone there. But I tell them in advance, that's where we're going. And I think that makes me pretty good at selling what I do to anyone who cares to ask. I'm not going to go out of my way to like stand on the street corner and proselytize about it. But it sounds pretty appealing, I think. Why? Because I'm exactly clear on what it is and I'm enthusiastic about it. And if you ask most people, see, most people don't want to, who wants to look at their trauma? I mean, some people are addicted to looking at their trauma, <laughs> but, but, um, but people don't want to go through unpleasant stuff. They don't want to be disillusioned, all that. Fair enough. That's true. Mm -hmm. So that's not, that's not what I focus on because that's not the point. The point is the crystal clarity. The point is the freedom. The point is the getting unstuck. And then you ask the question, would it be worth it to me? Would it be worth whatever it is I charge and the amount of time it takes, time out of their day or whatever, to risk that I'm going to come out of it with a more empowered, curious perspective and I'm going to be unstuck and I'm going to have the ability to do something about this shitty situation? Yeah. People yeah. get to decide that for themselves. I can't tell them that. Totally. And there's no way of knowing for whom that's going to be the case. Yeah. Yeah, I think just to put slightly different language around it, you know, as you're talking about alignment with what, you know, it's often in reference to in relationship with something. Like every cell of my being was like, he's talking about the doubt. Like <laughs> this is this is my spiritual practice is is um, finding our way back to the Tao. Um, which the way that I like to think of it is, you know, if we can sort of layer in this work that we've been talking about with trauma is we're all born as unique little creatures, you know, like you were saying, you've got perfect pitch. You can like, that's something that is an inherent gift of yours. And we have an innumerable amount of those gifts and, and, in the course of our lives, we have these conditions put on us. We have, you know, narratives and stories that society wants to put on us. We have trauma that gets layered on. And I find that by the time we're, you know, in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, there's like, like old paint layered on <laughs> layer after layer. And, and this work of, finding alignment, finding that truth, finding that integrity is about, you know, I, I often say that spirituality is this subtractive process of finding those layers of paint and stripping them away and getting back down to those deeper layers. And to me, like that, that crystal clear center is your Tao. You know, yeah. that's your path. That's your purpose. That is, you know, there's, yeah. there's so many ways to describe it. 100%. And, and, you know, I think that there's so many traditions that are basically talking about the same thing. Oh, yeah. Here. 
you know, oh, absolutely. Just different vocabulary, different words, different mm -hmm. terminology, but it's all the same thing. We're all striving for the same thing. And if you can, right. you know, ripple that out into the collective, however that, that is for you. Right. Well, but, 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 ima but imagine, you know, the, the, whoever wrote the Tao, the Ching down, you know, being like, oh, but is this going to be accessible to Hindus? <laughs> no, this is one access point. Yes. You know, uh, Seattle is accessible via I-90. It's also accessible via the I-5. It's also accessible via some smaller highways. You know, all roads lead to Rome. Like, we have to make our pathway as well-paved and scenic and worth the drive mm -hmm. as possible. And I think often people have their eyes on the wrong prize, which yeah. is the goal, the destination, yeah. which they don't, they're not even clear on what the, you can't control that. They're not clear on the gift they're bringing. Mm -hmm. um, and often I think it seems to be the case that whatever that gift is that they want for other people, they're not insisting on it for themselves. Mm. They're not applying their own oxygen mask first, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is why they're so lightheaded. Mm -hmm. I have to be crystal clear about what I'm doing. Otherwise I'm useless mm -hmm. at my thing. That's number one rigor. Yeah. Never mind self care as a sort of gentle, loving, uh, you know, healing, soothing balm, nothing wrong with it mm -hmm. like that. Many of us, you know, have to learn to do that for ourselves. But also like maintenance, just like self maintenance, just like mm -hmm. change your oil, like brush your teeth, brush your teeth and tend to your gift mm -hmm. and make sure that you're the primary recipient of it. Not because it's about you, but it starts with you. Yeah. And if yeah. you don't know it inside out, if you don't have that taste bud activated, if you don't have it at the, on the tip of your tongue at your fingertips, then you're manufacturing a secondhand air, ersatz version of it that no longer that you're alienated from mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. not going to sparkle. It's not going to resonate with that same brilliance, yeah. which is your brilliance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that as you know, a lot of the folks listening are, are would consider themselves to be practitioners the the most important that responsibility that you have is to do this work that you're speaking of is to tend to the self is to be responsible for your own self and for your own you know oxygen mask because without that level of integration it's just going to be a superficial thing you're just funny how be... funny how integrity and integration are almost the same word. Mm, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Totally. Integrity doesn't mean being a moral, virtuous individual. Integrity means holding together. Yes. Being complete. Mm -hmm. Miss lacking nothing, missing mm -hmm. no parts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what integrity means. Yeah. It's structural. Yeah. Yeah. And it's that integration that makes you a solid practitioner, which yeah. then, you know, in whatever way you want to build your business, you know, that's, that's how it shows up. You know? Yep. And, and that includes people who are, you know, off in the psychedelic realm. That's a, that's a place where integration, the word integration gets thrown around a lot. It's especially it's, it important. probably needed more. <laughs> uh, it's needed more. Why? <laughs> because the experience that's being had is being had on foreign territory. Mm -hmm. It's an away game. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. You got to come back home and plant the little bulbs that you cultivated over there. You got to yeah. put it into practice at home. And some people, many people, and I've been there when I was deep in the ayahuasca world mm -hmm. and I'm not slagging that world. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people doing beautiful work and it's a beautiful, powerful, mind blowing tradition mm -hmm. when done in the tradition, not so much when done as a business. Mm -hmm. Um, but people want to hang out with the peak experience. Mm -hmm. 
They like feeling a certain way. Yeah. But that's escaping from your life. That's not, yes. that's not healing your life. In fact, that's yes. deepening the, the fracture because you have an aversion mm-hmm. to the parts of you that aren't yeah. feeling that way. Right. Yeah. And that's when you start to turn a medicine into a drug. And I think anyone can do that with anything. anything with anything. Be, absolutely. It can be vivifying or it can be intoxicating. And mm-hmm. the two feelings can sometimes be hard to distinguish. So you have to look at the results. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I find that actually those two feelings, at least for me in my body, like they feel very, very different. Okay. What's you know? the difference? I mean, I'm glad to hear that. It's probably true for me, but this is a nuance that and yeah. I think, I, I think I'm learning, like, especially in the realm of like romance, mm-hmm. I'm, I've been, I'm, I'm currently getting sober from a life of thinking that intoxication is love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I am learning the difference and it's weird. Mm. Like part of me is like, what happened to that old thing? I missed the old thing. And then I'm like, well, but you remember what happens every time, Yeah. but only a hundred percent of the time. And it's like, yeah, but maybe next time I'm like, well, that's what you say every time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm kind of in, but so maybe I do know what you mean, but I, yeah. But it sounds like you've integrated that. I feel like the most tangible way that I can think of it is, um, is with alcohol. Mm. You know, I struggled for many years with alcohol and like kind of similarly to like what you're speaking of, there's this, you know, like literal level of intoxication, but there's so much stuff that feels really validating that comes with alcohol with me. Um, and you know, there, I had to take a break from drinking for about three years and, you know, I, I drink now, but it's now in a, in a way where I reach for it when it's like, Ooh, I want to celebrate. It's, it's a fun date night or, you know, it's like, I get to, to have like, it's, it's almost like a welcome friend, but of course there are still days and nights where I know if I have one drink, it's going to turn into seven or eight. Mm -hmm. And, and it's on those days where there's a sensation in my body. It it almost feels like it's like a, like a leaning forward, like from like, like my ribs is what it feels like. And Mm -hmm. like, that's the moment where I'm like, Ooh, no, today, today's not the day, you know? And and it's, you know, it's taken a long time to integrate. Um, but for me, it's, it's always the body that speaks. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not my strongest domain is body mm. awareness. Mm. My, my mind is so competent and it has such dominion over so much. I mean, and it, it knows so much even about healing and about wellness and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very much like, I got this. Don't worry, Daniel. It's like, yeah. <laughs> You're in good hands. And, mm. you know, meanwhile, it's the nutty professor. Like, it's just, um, so yeah. I mean, I, I, I have that, what you're describing with alcohol. I have that with marijuana. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a tricky thing to learn. And yeah. ultimately we have to get sick of not knowing it, not being clear about it. And we have to really get the cost, but I think more positively, we got to get you have to fall in love with the clarity. Mm-hmm. You have to really value it because mm-hmm. you know, when you really love and value something, everything else kind of the temptations become less potent. Mm-hmm. It's like when you marry someone, you don't stop being attracted to other people, mm-hmm. but the agreement of marriage is the agreement to, to centralize that and to make that more important than anything else and to honor that. And that's what integrity becomes Mm -hmm. not because adultery is wrong, but because you gave your word and because it's for something. Yeah. And to, and to circle back to what you just said of like, you know, it's, it's the clarity that you fall back in love with, you know, um, you know, I think for 
a long time, I, I felt like I needed to be in chaos or saving the other person in order for it to feel like love. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and, you know, of course, you know, I'm married now. And of course there are, you know, moments of attraction with other people because we're all human beings. And the thing that I keep coming back to is the clarity of the relationship that my husband and I have built. Mm. And, and, and that seems like something that I want to step towards more so than the fleeting levels of attraction that I feel. Great. Mm. May it always be thus. Mm. (laughs) Well, um, I, put out a call for questions on my Instagram community and I would love to just see where, where those questions take you. Yeah. Um, so the first question, like I've had asked multiple different ways, but essentially they were all asking the same thing. Um, yes, I'm single, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is around your relationship with your dad. Uh, Mm-hmm. <laughs> a oh, little bit one. of an, a little bit of a 180 degree turn from <laughs> yes I'm single um, there might be a connection <laughs> but I won't put that on him <laughs> that's that one's on me mm-hmm. so I'm gonna try to like crystallize all the threads that that were coming in because um, they were all about how do you move through i mean we sort of talked about forgiveness already but like how do we move towards like integration with our parents as adult children (laughs) yeah (laughs) which i mean i didn't realize you guys were writing a book together about this but like oh yeah like great time to (laughs) to share that piece when's this podcast coming out uh Mm, probably mid a mid May ish. Mid May, okay. So yeah. in mid in mid April, which is about three weeks from when we're currently recording this, my dad and I are kicking off the writing of the book with a week long road trip through the American West together. That's exciting. Yeah, we've been pl- we've been talking about doing a road trip for years, and we decided mm-hmm. to, um, and we've been you know understandably putting off the writing of this because we've been promoting myth of normal and I'm working on my musical right now and all kinds of stuff, but we're, we have to get started because it's got to happen. So the question is a good one. And I hope to find, ask me at the end of my road trip, (laughs) (laughs) I kid, but not, um, I mean, look, we've been running a workshop on this for six years, so we should have something to say about it. Mm. Um, I think I'm not going to give a how to. No, of course. Be- because no first of all, that. yeah, the how to would first of all presume that there's one way or two ways. And it's also it would presume that every that everyone is up to the same thing. That that integrating with your like that's such a broad, vague, fuzzy, like try to describe to me what that means. You can't, it's Mm -hmm. going to mean something different for everyone. So again, it's one of these, like these phrasings that if we drill down into it, it's empty, Mm -hmm. it's empty of content. It's just a nice sounding thing. It sounds nice. We think we should have it. Mm -hmm. The question is, what do you want? Mm -hmm. What do you actually want? Mm -hmm. And this is, I think there unintentionally, there was something smart in the way we phrased the workshop to begin with. And this will be the title and subtitle of the book as well. Hello again, a fresh start for parents and their adult children. Mm. Now notice we don't say a happy ending for parents and their adult children. We don't say healing and integration, forgiveness and love. None of that. It's a fresh start. Well, now we have, you know, a standard to judge something by what would be a fresh start for you? What would be a fresh start for you would not necessarily be a fresh start for somebody else. Mm -hmm. For somebody else, your fresh start would sound like an insane jump off a building. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. A fresh start for them would be visiting them one time and not having the same argument Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and actually enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Or it would, for some people, a fresh start would be, we're not going to talk to each other for two years. Yeah. (laughs) On it. It's not, that's, I mean, no one is better than the other. Each one is going to, has to be appropriate to its, and every relationship is different and every history is different. So that's number one, give up any generalized sense of should and assuming you know what the goal is. You don't know what the goal is. Mm -hmm. Check in with yourself. What is bugging you about it? Mm -hmm. What would you love a break from? What would be a new possibility if you could imagine it being even just a little bit different Mm -hmm. in a way that would be totally revolutionary? What would that be? Well, now you're starting to get your, you're starting to get a lead and a read on an intention that you can actually do something with. It's actually actionable. Once you've got that, then you have to confront the fact that the odds are against you. Now, I'm not saying that to discourage people. Um, It's actually meant to be empowering. What do I mean by that? Well, when we do our workshop, first of all, we have a Friday night public event where we each give a talk and there's a number of those on YouTube uh, that people can watch, lengthy ones, and they've been very popular and controversial. People seem to have a lot of opinions about them. People seem to take sides a lot, which is really funny, depending on what filter they're looking through. You look at the comments, it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. But, um, and everyone's right and everyone's wrong. In my opinion. So the people who say I'm a spoiled brat who hates his father and the people who say my dad's a narcissistic asshole and the people who say that we're both lovely human beings who are making such a difference in the world and the both people who say this is all ridiculous. Everyone's correct. Both and. <laughs> both and. <Andy>, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, but then we move into the weekend and it's a smaller group. And the first thing we do is we not everyone comes with a parent or an adult child. Some people come alone. Mm-hmm. to look at their relationship to the relationship. Yeah. Some people, the other person is dead or hopelessly addicted or demented or they're estranged. Mm-hmm. But whoever it is, you know, for the people who come in together, we separate them. Mm. For the first day and a half, we say, you are not qualified to sit together yet. <laughs> you're in no position to do any work on the relationship now because you don't see it clearly. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to be able to see it clearly sitting next to each other because you're going to be too locked into the dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first thing. And then we get into all the impediments. We, the first day is entirely looking at why the odds are stacked against you. And that's not your fault. It's because this relationship is unlike any other. Mm-hmm. Just in the way it's set up. Yeah, of course. There is no other relationship like it mm-hmm. in so many ways. It's a relationship that moves from the most radical kind of inequality to some hope or allegation of possible equality without even knowing what that equality means. You start with one person choosing to enter into the relationship by creating the other. The other has no say in the matter of being created, wasn't even around. When the other arrives on the scene, they're not a person yet. They're just a organism, an autonomic nervous system doing what it does, they're still forming. The first person is completely responsible for that one, entirely has the power of their life and death in their hands. Mm -hmm. And everything about the young person's life with the older person will determine the rest of the younger person's life in many ways. Yeah. Their their biology, you know, it's not deterministic, but it's influential heavily. If my dad's work is, this is the thing, the implications of my dad's work are that this relationship should be impossible (laughs) to to update because it's so based in the past, Mm -hmm. but it's not impossible. You just have to be realistic about what you're dealing with. You have to be realistic about the fact that, Hey, you know what? Unlike anybody else, let's say I was married. I was married at one point. My spouse has the ability to trigger my deepest wounds. Yes. Mm -hmm. Your husband can do that. Not this one. My last one. Yeah. Okay, great. (laughs) Spouses do, but I promise you this one does just hasn't happened yet. 
that which means you're you're a great match. But I mean, it could happen in in a moment of stress. Even even at at a you know, there's nothing wrong with that. When we deeply deeply care, when we're deeply invested, and we're deeply allied and collaborative, sometimes there's going to be sparks. Anyway, when my spouse triggers my deepest wounds, they're reminding me of someone else. Mm -hmm. When my friends trigger my deepest wounds, they're reminding me of someone else in another time. When my brother and sister trigger my deepest wounds, they might be reminding me of them, but it's different. Mm -hmm. When my parents trigger my deepest wounds, they're reminding me of them, yeah. of my relationship with them, of when I met them, yep. <laughs> of when they controlled my life, mm -hmm. when they created the, the world in which I lived, over which I had no power. Now, do I have the power now? Yes. Objectively, yes. But my nervous system was conditioned by their nervous system. And so it's a very fine needle to thread. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to help people do. But again, you have to see the nuances. Mm -hmm. So yes, forgiveness. Yes, integration. Yes, healing. But what do those things actually require? They are not a la carte. It's not dim sum. Yeah. You can't say, oh, you know, I'll have two healings and a... <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a grace, please. No, it doesn't come like that. You have to set the, you set the ground for it. And it's like the chef special, whatever the chef wants to bring you, you know, yeah. and when you're ready for it, maybe it comes forgiveness. You know, Shakespeare said the quality of mercy is not strained. Mm -hmm. It droppeth as the gentle rain from heaven. I love that. Mm -hmm. So that's what it takes. It takes a willingness to engage with the near, the sort of, outsized complexity of this and the fact also this is the last thing I'll say you have to you must really get it straight in your head that you don't have to mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying yeah this relationship in some ways more than any other any other kind of relationship is optional once you're both grown ups mm -hmm. Friends, you need friends. You might not need this friend. Most of us need friends. Some people don't need friends. Fine. You don't need to be married, but, you know, you chose to enter into it. The stakes, once you're married, that relationship matters. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, your relationship with your parents matters on a deep emotional level. But once you're a grown up, you guys are going to be fine without each other. You can do whatever with it. This is why it, this is why the, it is the way it is in the world. It's the most, it is what it is relationship. Yeah. This is why people say, I'll see you at Thanksgiving. And mm -hmm. then for the month of November, they're like, okay, I just need to get through a weekend. Mm -hmm. Ugh, a long weekend, the longest weekend of my year. And then I don't have to see them again for another year. Well, why would they do that? Because they have the option of doing that. You can also opt out boot, boot them out of your life you can opt out and you yeah. will be fine yeah. the point is if you engage in integrating this relationship healing it i would say updating it i would use the least emotionally loaded language the <laughs> least airy fairy new age whatever especially if you have parents who don't speak that language any parent you know a fox news watching parent would be interested in rebooting the relationship mm -hmm. You know, if they're a tech person, you call it rebooting it, which is to say, I want to know you in the present. Now, maybe they wouldn't be, but again, you want to talk about accessibility, talk about it in a way that has the biggest on-ramp yeah. and that's truthful. But if you choose to, to engage with this, then you're choosing to, and you are accepting the consequences. Mm -hmm. I love this answer for so many reasons because you know, I, I never want to ask a how to question because there's that level of prescription that always seems to tumble out of people's mouths. And there's so much permission in your answer 
for the relationship to be not even necessarily like what it needs to be, but like, like it can be any number of things from feeling very close and healed and integrated to feeling very far away from each other and integrated. Emancipated. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, ha- having integrity as separate individuals in the world. Yeah. People didn't always stick around and have like ongoing relationships with their parents. Mm-hmm. People went off to seek their fortunes and maybe wrote home and maybe never saw their parents again. Yeah. That doesn't mean they weren't complete with their parents. Yeah, exactly. That that was the arrangement. That was the yeah. agreement. Yeah. And, it, and we stay psychologically fused with them and we stay in these dramas and we talk about we, we, there is no we. <laughs> You know, it, here's one prescription. Here's here's a tip. It's, it's sort of just a tip, you know. <laughs> this isn't medicine, but it's physiotherapy. Give up this notion that the relationship is 50-50. Mm-hmm. If you want it to be miserable, shrieking hell, make it 50-50. Because then you stop at the 50-yard line and you're screaming at the other person being like, why aren't you meeting me here? <laughs> I won't go another step further. If you want to have a relationship that works, and the truth, this is true with anyone, really, it's got to be 100-100. But what does that mean? It just means 100. Because mm. the minute you say 100, their 100 doesn't, it's got nothing, it's none of your business. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know? So yeah. if there ever was an unhealthy we, see, part of the trauma was the blurring of boundaries. Yeah. That needed to exist when you were that needed little, to little, exist. Little. That's right. But your parents couldn't see them and you, you know, so you can't fix the problem with the same mindset that created it. And you can't heal the trauma by doubling down on the dynamics. Mm-hmm. So that starts with getting a kind of psycho emotional surgery, mm-hmm. you know, you, 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 you have to step aside and be like, okay, here I am with all of my flaws, with all of my wounds. Um, yeah, I have other things I could say about it. I've been, I keep learning about it as we go. It's a very, very interesting and very nuanced thing I'm, I'm learning, Yeah, but it's exciting. I'm excited yeah. about it and I'm excited that people are so excited about it. It's speaking about niches. You know, this is about niching up. I mean, we've stumbled upon the biggest niche in the world, as far as I can tell. You go into yeah. any bookstore, how many shelves are there about parenting children yeah. from conception to college drop off? How many shelves are there about letting go of dying or dead or demented parents? It's a couple of, sh- so, there's a couple of sh- books here and there about, you know, healing from or coping with narcissistic, toxic parents. A few books about kicking your deadbeat kids out of the basement at age 35. There's nothing about the, all the decades in between. And what are you going to do with the choice you have in this matter? Yeah. And yet everyone is living the consequences of that non-conversation. Yeah. So we are stepping into talk about accessibility on paper. This should be a more accessible book than the myth of normal. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like, I think it's the choice that people are so scared of, mm-hmm. you know, like I remember when I first uh, started getting to know my husband and he had estranged relationships with a couple of members of his family. And like, I was just at the time, like flabbergasted that anyone could cut members of their family out of their lives like this. And as I started learning more about the dynamics of his family, it's like, oh, that was actually the most mature thing and the most healthy thing that you could do for both of you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, leaving that on the table as a choice for folks, because people are so wrapped in shame and guilt and, you know, blood is thicker than water sort of mentality around it. Like, Espe- that's- especially when it coagulates <laughs> and, and, and clots, <laughs> blood, blood clots are thicker than water too. Oh God. Oh, these cliches. You know, yeah, just, I know. I know. Just, I love poke. I love. I love popping the bubbles of. These I love things. it. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> but I mean, that's essentially keep that blood like clots your... are thicker than water. I'm gonna, What's I'm that? Gonna, I'm going to use that in the book. That's new. Do it. <laughs> I'm going to take a little note. Sorry. Mm-hmm. All right. Sorry. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's totally true though. It's like, like, why do we continue to engage in relationships that just create more stagnation instead when there's a, an, an off ramp, you know, there's an ability, there's a choice here. Well, right. And at the very least take the off ramp and then go look at it from a distance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You keep yeah. beating your head against the same wall, going back to the same well, even when it's dry. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And you end up feeling crazy and you blame them for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I feel like you've thoroughly answered that question that came from a couple of folks um, in the community. And then I had one question. I hope I'm going to paraphrase this correctly because she had whole paragraphs. So Tamara, this one's for you. <laughs> um, she was sort of expressing her observation of collective trauma bonding as it's expressed in visual media. So like maybe overplaying certain news cycles or movies that are really pounding on activating nervous systems. And I would even expand that out to not just visual media, but like all sorts of media out there. Mm -hmm. Um, Her question is, if you had a Netflix series or some platform where you could like express whatever it is that you wanted to express, what would it feature? That's a good question. I mean, Netflix series is not the medium that comes to mind for me. I'm sort of, I draw a blank when it comes to that kind of medium. Um, so fill in whatever platform you think, yeah, well, I, I write. I, I was thinking like, you'd probably I, want to go for like musicals. Yeah, I write musicals. Mm-hmm. I write musicals. So I don't have to be theoretical. What would I do? I'll tell you what my musicals seem to have in common through mm-hmm. no design of my own. And by the way, I would add pornography to the list of things that she was talking about in terms of mm-hmm. excitation of the nervous system and a kind of, well, a literal eroticization of collective trauma mm-hmm. in many ways. You know? mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not mm-hmm. saying that's all it can be, but that's certainly what the industry and, and, and the massive impact it's had on our culture mm. uh, is creating. Um, well, my musicals seem to be about people on the worst days of their lives, uh, <laughs> dealing with calamities and being human in the process. Mm. Uh, let me count. Let me sort of run it down. My first musical is called the trouble with Doug. I wrote this, started writing it in grad school in 2007 Last time we did it was in Denmark in 2017. And it's based on Kafka's Metamorphosis. Mm. In our show, Doug turns into a giant talking, singing slug. But I never, <laughs> but I never rhyme Doug with slug in the show because that would just be too easy. That's just a feat in and of itself, I think. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's I hold myself to a, to a high, certain standard as a lyricist. Um, and it's about, unlike the Kafka story, which is sort of a, a satire of, well, an absurdist satire of capitalism because, you know, he's a worker and he's, he turns into a bug and he's still thinking, how do I get to the office? And, and then he ends up, it's sort of dark and alienating. Ours focuses on his family's attempts to deal with the impact of this calamity on the family system <laughs> and his attempt to, because he was the glue that f- held the family together mm-hmm. and letting go of his identity as he turns more and more into this mollusk, this invertebrate thing. And then his girlfriend is in the mix, like trying to deal with like, they weren't even engaged yet, but all of a sudden she's right up against this, these in-laws, you know, and everyone goes through some kind of transformation as a result, some kind mm-hmm. of metamorphosis. So there's a transformation that happens in the face of tragedy, calamity, the unexplainable. I wrote a show based on the book of Job from the Bible, the saddest story of all time. You know, again, there was humor in it, but it was about trying to find meaning in the face of deep, deep, deep trauma. Mm -hmm. 
but also what gets revealed about the trauma that's already there when disaster strikes. And my latest musical, I have a lighter show called Middle School Mysteries, which is about a couple of sixth grade detectives trying to solve the case of the missing middle schooler. And it's done in kind of a film noir style. This is, it's a show for kids. It's done in kind of a film noir style. So the kids are like, ah, listen, see, ah. <laughs> you went off on so many tangents down there. I thought you was a protractor. Ah. <laughs> uh, and it's written, you know, the jazzy, but, but there's tragedy in it. There's deep loneliness in it. There's the kids are playing these roles in a sense to cover up the fact that they're just kids and they're scared. Yeah. And it's sort of a metaphor for the roles and the masks that we play in life and also the sort of dark apoc like the sort of under the sort of seedy the experience of being in middle school and the sort of weird gosh middle school in and of, and of itself is just traumatizing so yeah, yeah exactly exactly right my latest show is called the sweet hereafter and it's based on a novel by russell banks that was made into a film by adam agoyan a canadian filmmaker in the 90s and it was very popular in canada it won an Academy Award. No, it was nominated. Did it win Best Foreign Film? It might have, and it won a, it won, um, a, a, a top prize at the Cannes Festival. But the novel is American, and I've adapted the novel into a musical, and it's about a school bus crash in a small rural town mm. that kills like many of the kids in the town. Mm. Not exactly a fun song and dance romp, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not... Mm -hmm. It's not uplifting like Les Mis. It's not, but I mean, but it's, and it's not wicked. It's not Mamma Mia, certainly, you know, mm -hmm. it's about human beings, real human beings dealing with the unimaginable mm -hmm. and dealing with themselves in the face of the unimaginable because all kinds of stuff comes to the surface in the community and everyone in a sense has to go through a deep disillusionment. Everyone has to let the past die in a way, mm -hmm. which in the end is a kind of grace. There's a reason the book and the show is called the sweet hereafter. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a, there's a sweet, there's a, but it's about the hidden, the mystery in tragedy. Mm -hmm. It's not a rosy picture. It's not like buck up. Think, look on the bright side. No, it's very ambivalent. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of stuff I want to put out in the world. Mixed feelings, I would say. Mm. That's the thing I want to put out in the world. That's what I respond to in art. Um, and I also just want to put out stuff that's extremely well-crafted, that's fun to listen to, that's beautiful, that has you know gut-punch lyrics, that has that's music musically satisfying, that's got soul to it, you know, mm -hmm. that 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 matches the music that I love, and that doesn't sound like it's only been drinking at the teat of American musical theater all its life mm -hmm. because that's a copy of a copy of a copy. Musical theater is a, is a, is a lake that's best fed in by a lot of different streams, you know, and yeah. it can become yeah. a stagnant pool sometimes. Yeah. Like how many more Sondheims do we really need? <laughs> well, we could use some more Sondheims, but, but genuine Sondheims, not Sondheim mm -hmm. ripoffs. Mm -hmm. if, I mean, if we had more Sondheims that I, I wouldn't complain, which is to say, you know, and I fancy myself someone who aspires to that, mm. not his aesthetic, not his sound, mm -hmm. God knows, but it, but the rigor of how he wrote for characters, his understanding of what theater is, what musical theater is, and what the implications are of having characters sing on a stage mm -hmm. and what, what, what lyrics require and the difference between writing a pop song and writing a theater song. Mm -hmm. And a willingness to go there to those dark places and show people at their worst, but have you root for them or love them or feel unexpected empathy and the willingness to show people being really cruel to each other and ha with the willingness to trust your audience that uh, to be intelligent enough to feel multiple things at once, mm -hmm. the willingness to not have to give a cheerful set, like a cheerful ending. This is why into the woods is my least favorite Sondheim show because even though it tries to be kind of dark and nuanced, I find it a little yeah. too uplifting for my taste. But anyway, I, I could say a lot about Sondheim and he's greatly missed. No more. We don't need more sound alikes, yeah. but we do need more soul alikes, I think, yeah. because he yeah. was a special soul. Yeah. And I mean, I think that that's what 
if there's been any sort of thread we've been following through this whole conversation, it's it's been that like heart can't be faked and mimicked and um, that level of integrity and integration is, is really what the world is craving these days. And, and I think that that's, you know, that sort of speaks to Tamara's question here of like, what are we really doing by just like activating people's nervous systems, hoping that that somehow touches their heart and instead, like, can we go to the depths of these really, you know, like heartfelt intentions? Yeah, I would liken it. I would liken it to high glycemic and low glycemic carbs. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm on a keto diet right now, so I'm not really having much of either. But you know, there's stuff that hits your bloodstream instantly, and there's stuff that's got fiber that can be, in, you know, that breaks down more slowly, that's more nutritious, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that has fewer negative side effects Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. lasting damage. Yeah. Um, create high glycemic, sorry, great low glycemic glycemic content, content. high fiber, (laughs) high fiber content. It can be tasty. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for spending so much time with me. I really like the time flew by. I wasn't really paying attention to the clock and, and I, I feel so grateful that you were so generous with your time and um, so generous with your wisdom and um, appreciate all the work that you're putting out in the world. And, and thank you. You're welcome. And thank you. Mm. <laughs>